So then just uh, I could show you the, the result, but I think it, it helps to explain if we go through what we need to do to get the numbers. So in the last case, we have just 10,000, like the World Trade Center or some problem, right? Can affect the tourism companies. So we saw that there was a terrorist attack in France, so the tourism company stock price went down, right? Because it, the airline, the hotels, that kind of company. Because it can affect tourism. And this also, this company is doing travel, okay? So they could be affected negatively by that kind of thing. So if that happens, they could have, it's possible they could have a volume of just 10,000. Now, what we have to think about here is we made, if we made a forward contract for 25,000 and the exchange rate changes, what's going to happen, right? So this case, case was quite straightforward. We have 5,000 extra customers, okay? So we had this situation or this situation, right? So again, in this case, we're going to have 15,000 less customers, okay? So it means we're just going to have 10,000 customers. So first of all, we should calculate what effect 15,000 is going to have, right? So we just, uh, we can do the same kind of calculation that we did before. So. we'll end up with a number, right? The base case scenario is 18 million. And then we have 15 million and 22 million. Okay, so here we can see that's a difference of 3 million, that's a difference of about 4 million. Okay, but now what we need to figure out is what's a loss and what's a gain. So the last time we just added on, okay? But let's think about it now. If we do nothing, what's the, our result at 122? If the exchange rate stays the same at 122, we do nothing, do we make any gain or loss on the exchange rate? Hmm? What do you think? Zero. Zero, right? The exchange rate is 122. <coughs> then we didn't make any gain or loss on the exchange rate. Okay, then do nothing. The exchange rate is 101. Do we make a gain or a loss? This is not, we'll, forward will be more complicated later, right? But this is do nothing. Do we make a gain or a loss if we do nothing and the exchange rate changed to this side? Gain, right? How much is our gain now? It's going to be higher than 5 million or less than 5 million? Less than 5 million. How much less? So we're going to see. Uh, calculate the difference between, so we'll say it equals to this one, okay, and then the gain that we would have made for uh, the 15,000 people, right? This was the gain we made for the 15,000, this one minus this one, right? It costs $15 million instead of $18 million. And take that away and we'll get 2.1. So we made a profit of 2.1. Okay, what about here? How much loss will we make? More than 6.5 or less than 6.5? We have a lower number of students. We are doing nothing. Are we going to make bigger loss or lower loss? Lower loss, right? So how much is the loss lower? Equals to this one plus the difference of these ones, right? This one minus this one, right? Well, we might have to do minus there. So we have a lower loss, a lower gain and a lower loss. 2.1 million or 2.6 million, okay? So now we get to forward contracts. So we made a forward contract to exchange the money at one, point, at one uh, at this, right, for 30 million, 30 million uh, dollars. So, <coughs> what's going to be the result first at 122? Is there any 
loss. We are changing that money from dollars to euros at 122. And now we need to change it back at 122. Did we make any profit or loss? No, right? We're changing it back at the same exchange rate, right? Uh, then what about here? We have the exchange rate got stronger, right? But we have changed 30, we already made this deal to change $30,000 at 122 and get 25,000 euros, right? But now do we need 25,000 euros? No, we just need 10,000 euros, right? So now we have 15,000 euros that we don't need that we need to change back into dollars, right? So if I change uh, 15,000 euros into dollars at 101, then how many dollars will I get back? How many, uh, if I change my euros back into dollars, I'm just going to get this much. Okay, $15,150, okay? And I should get this much. I need to get back this much to pay back the contract. So my loss is going to be the difference between here and here. Okay? So uh, here we are going to have a loss on the forward contract. Okay? And then here on the other side, if the exchange rate changes like this, then we, we have 15,000 euros that we need to change back to dollars. So we're going to change back at this exchange rate. We're going to get back this much dollars. So we're going to make a profit here. Okay. Then what about options? So in options, we, we can look up here, the first one that we did for options. Uh, why has that changed? Well, let's look at the first sheet, right? When we looked at options here, we had, uh, in the first line, here we had the profit. We could take the profit from the exchange rate, okay, by doing nothing. But here, uh, we are going to still take profit from the exchange rate. Uh, so <coughs> maybe we can go back and just explain using this side here. So. Uh, in this case, we get to 101. We said that on the forward contract, we're going to make a, a loss of 0 0.315 and a gain of 3,900, okay? So if we have the options contract in this case, in which case are we going to use the contract? On this side or on this side? Options is like a forward contract, but we have the option to use it or not. So in this case, are we, the forward contract gives us a gain. In this case, the forward contract gives us a loss, right? So in which case are we going to use, use keep the contract? At 148 or at 101? If we keep the contract at 101, we're going to have a bigger loss, right? We're going to keep the contract here, at 148, okay? Then we can get this minus the premium, okay? and we'll end up with this much money, okay? Then, uh, in the middle, we're just minus the premium, okay? And then on this side, uh, we can decide to tear up the contract. We're not going to keep the contract. <coughs> so, we, we end up with this amount. <coughs> so, we end up, in the end, with uh, this kind of a graph on the last one. So have a look at this graph and tell me which which one are you going to choose. This is the last graph. We can notice that the forwards is now in a little bit different direct, di direction, right? Is the forwards risky in this case or not risky? risky? Forwards is very risky in this case, right? Because what you've done is you've purchased that amount of euros at 122. If you don't need the euros, you have to change them back to dollars, okay? So if the volume is very low, 
you're going to have to change euros back to dollars, okay? And then that's like a open exchange rate position, okay? So that's the first thing we can note. So discuss with your partner. What are you going to use here? nothing tear up the contract minus the premium is still giving us a profit for options on this side okay but forwards has changed around so on this side if we keep the contract we also make a profit okay because when we change the euros back we're getting higher exchange rate so we get to keep we get a profit here minus the premium so options in this one looks good it's profit here or profit here just we lose the premium if we're in the middle Exactly at 122, that's where we lose the premium. But we start to go on this side, or we start to go on this side, we start making a profit. Okay? So then now we've looked at the three situations, we have to decide, right? How much, I want you to make a decision with your partner. What are you going to do? You have to decide for the company, it's your decision. 50% options, 50% forwards, 70% forwards, 30% options. 10% do nothing, 20% options, 60% forwards, okay? So discuss with your partner and tell me a definite plan. I'm the CEO, okay, and you're the financial manager. So tell me a definite plan, what should I do? And have a reason, think of a reason, okay? So I'll make it so you can see the three graphs here. Okay. These are the three situations, the numbers, numbers and graphs. Okay. So we've done our spreadsheet, so...
So, we already saw that they, they gave the example of one year they did nothing 20%, right? And they got burnt. So they don't want to do nothing at all, right? They're going to cover. So the question is how much forwards and how much options, okay? So just choose one of these options with your partner and I'll do a survey and see where we're getting. This is forwards and this is options. Okay? Just I'll check the one you choose. Let's see where we end up. Okay, so EJ Yuck, what are what do you choose? Yes. Do you need more time to discuss? situations equally, right? But are those three situations equal for the company or is one situation much worse than the other two? Are those three situations, the company doesn't care if we get 10,000 or 25,000 or 30,000, it doesn't matter to the company. Or it matters. What do you think? The company doesn't care how many customers it gets, or it cares how many customers it gets. What do you think? It cares or it doesn't care about the number of customers? It cares. Which is the worst one? Which one is, are they the same importance or is one more important? One is more, which one is more important? 25,000, 30,000, or 10,000, which situation is more important? That's what they want, but which one is the more risk the company doesn't want? I mean more important that the co company is more worried about. Which one is the company more worried about? 10,000, okay? So then let's go around and do a survey. What did you choose? This, you guys here, what did you choose? Quickly. Over hmm? 30, 70. What did you guys choose? 60, 40. 60, 40. Next. Each two students. Next pair. Next one. Next one. Next one. Fifty fifty. Sixty forty. Seventy thirty. Eighty twenty. Okay. So anyway, we're more on the side of forwards, but 
basically, to sum up, the reason why the company doesn't just use forwards, if we had transaction exposure, we would maybe we could just use forwards. It's very stable, right? And we expect it to be on this side, right? Then we could just use forwards. Okay? If we expect this side, it might be different. Okay? But we said the company expects on this side. So why don't they just use forwards? It's because of this one. We just get 10,000 customers. That's going to be a very bad situation for the company. We get a low number of customers. Okay? And then on top of that, we could also lose a lot of money on the forward contract. Okay? So the company really doesn't want to be here. They don't want to be 10,000 and here. So that's why they're not going to use 100% forwards. Okay? Do you understand? Yes. So that's why they use options too. Okay? So that if they're here, options, at least it's pretty sure they're going to make money, right? Unless it's right in the middle. Okay? At least they get less customers, but they can be pretty sure they're going to make a small bit of profit or at least limit their loss on the foreign exchange. Okay? So there's no one right answer. Maybe we can see the average answer is probably going to be 60, 40. Okay? The class two is 60, 40. That's not, that seems okay. But it depends also on how confident you are about your prediction. Okay? What, you, what your prediction is. Some people said that they thought it would get weaker, some people stronger. Okay? So do you have any question about the hedging the foreign exchange risk? No? Do you think you can make a plan like that? If you have a travel company? If you have your own travel company, can you make some Excel spreadsheet? Do this? Hmm? Yes, make that kind of calculation. If you work in the company and they ask you to do that, would you be able to do that? Yes. Hmm? Look at the volume, how much do they expect their sales to be, right? Worst case scenario, best case scenario, normal scenario, right? Make the different scenarios, look at the different exchange rate, and make some graph like that, okay? Make, look at the numbers and then make a plan. Okay? Of course, you could just turn up to the CEO and say, 50 50! Ah. <laughs> and then they say, Why? And you say, I like 50. 50 is a good number. <laughs> Why? 50 is my favorite number. Anyway, let's just do 50 50. It sounds okay. It's fair, right? Or it's better that you come up with some chart or some data like this, right? Of course it's better than you have this, you can present the graph and present the numbers, right? And explain about this is the worst situation, so we want to avoid this, so we need to use options. Okay? So hopefully we should all be able to make some financial plan for hedging. So then let's move on to the next, uh, next topic. Any more questions about hedging before we move on to the next topic? Hedging the currency risk. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, investing in international markets. Okay. So companies have money. What am I going to do with my money? The company has a lot of cash. Am I going to dig a hole in the ground and put it under the ground outside my factory? No. no. I put a security guard with a gun. No. What, am I, what, what should I do with my money? Can I only invest my money in Korea? No. Okay, so there are different options for me to invest the company's money in. Okay, different investment opportunities. We can, we can also decide to start our own business, FDI, right? Or we can just invest in the financial markets with our money. So we have different choices. So we are going to discuss the international money markets. And we're going to talk about the equity markets. So we look at these topics. So first of all, we look at the statistics. So we're going to look at the market capitalization of developed countries against developing countries. Okay. So the equity, the world's equity market has a lot of money. At the end of 2006, 54 billion. Okay. 81% is accounted for by the major equity markets from 29 developed countries. So what does this mean, market capitalization? That means if we multiply 
number of stocks multiplied by the stock price in the stock market, that is the market capitalization. Okay? So we have 10,000 companies, let's say, in the US, right? And then they sell the stocks, just for example. Okay? How much is their stock price? Five dollars. How many stocks are they selling? One million. What is their market capitalization in stocks? Five million. Okay? Each stock costs five dollars, they have one million dollars. Plus, next company. How, many, how much is the company's stock price? How many stocks do they have? Okay? This is market capitalization. It tells us about the value of the company. So we can see that this is called public company. Public companies are companies which sell stock. Private companies are companies which don't sell stock to who? To the public. Okay? Do you understand public? I can sell, you can buy some of my company, it's a public company. You can't buy some of my company, it's a private company. Okay? So traditionally, uh, maybe the developed countries tend to have more public companies. Whereas in many developing countries, for example, in, uh, the family company might be more important. The family control the company. They don't sell to the public. Okay? Just they keep privately in their own hand. Could be one reason. Okay? Another reason is that people like to invest in the US, for example. US is a good place to invest. Companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so there are different reasons, but we can see that uh, most of the stock markets we're talking about in the developed countries. Okay? That's where most of the money is. Uh, these days, the difference is getting smaller. Okay? The, especially the BRIC nations is catching up. So the other 19% is accounted for the developing countries. Emerging markets is better than developing countries. Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa. <coughs> so you can look at this link which will give us an idea of the different percentages. <clears throat> so this is the emerging market uh, capitalization percent of the global market. Uh, so we can see that it's getting bigger, right? So this is everything together is the gray line. In 2004, the emerging markets was just 6%, right? In 2010, the emerging markets is 20%. So we can see that the emerging market stock market is growing a lot. A lot of money is being invested in the stock markets. Over this period, this period here, some countries like Russia, Brazil, China, if you invested in stocks, stock market here, you could have made 200, 300% return on your stocks in just two or three years, right? Yes. So usually the stock market in emerging economies is more volatile. You can make more profit, but you can also lose more money. Okay, it's higher risk. But more people are investing there. What countries are they investing in? Red is China, blue is India, yellow is Brazil, Pink is Russia. Okay? So we can see the red part is taking up a lot of the thing, right? A lot of people is investing in China. China's share went from here to here. China is opening up little by little with the regulation. So more people. Uh, of course, Chinese people invest in their own stock market. Okay? Other countries Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Turkey, Malaysia, Mexico. So, uh, <coughs> we can see that the emerging market, the trend, the emerging market stock market is increasing. Capitalization. So, what is an emerging market? So, the definition is it is located in a low or middle income economy as defined by the World Bank. Okay? Low or middle income economy, how much is people earning? The average income of people in one year. And then, this is actually a measurement of emerging markets. It's market capitalization is low. Okay? So the stock market is not that developed. Okay? Then, it's 
another reason why you could be classified as an emerging economy. Okay? <clears throat> so the equity markets of the developed world tend to be more liquid. Liquidity refers to how quickly an asset can be sold without a price concession, without dropping the price. Can I buy a factory near here tomorrow and sell it the next day at the same price? No, oh, that's not liquid. I'll have to make a big price concession, 50%. Okay? So if I'm dealing in the shares in Google, a lot of people are buying and selling Google. Okay? So it's a very liquid. So developed markets is more liquid. So investments in emerging markets, we should focus on the long term. Okay? It could be more profitable, but also because it's very volatile, it can change a lot in the short time period. Uh, how much did the Chinese stock market change this year in Shanghai? Does anybody know? No. Shanghai stock market. Let's look at the Shanghai stock market as an example why we should invest in the long term. If you're following the news, uh, you would know that the uh, here's a 10-year chart of China, right? Investing in the Shanghai stock market. Oh, look, I made 300 400% profit. I'm really happy, right? <laughs> Did I make a really big profit? No. Yes, my stock price went from, here it's hard to see, 1,000 to 4,000, okay? 1,000, sorry, to 5, 6,000. So less than one. I'm sorry, from one to six. So I made five or six hundred percent profit. Okay? In just a couple of years, two years. Okay? Would you be happy with six hundred six times your money in two years? Oh yes. Yes? Then invest in China now, quick! <laughs> right. Go home, what are you waiting for? Well you can see the problem. It's more volatile. But back down five hundred percent. Right? Then up again and down, right? Now recently, last year we went on a big rally. Okay? And then this year, a big loss. Now it's going back up again. Quick! <laughs> Maybe you can go back up. To the... It's time to go. You think so? So the point about this is you can make more money, you can make more loss investing in the emerging market because the stock market is more volatile. Okay? compared to the developed markets. So it's better to invest for the long term. So if I invested here, I would have gone through this part, and I would have gone through this part, and I would have gone through this and this, but I still have about 300% return, okay? And in 10 years, okay? Do you understand the idea? Even if I invested here, I thought it's at the top, I could still have got my money back at a higher price later. So you should invest on the long term in the emerging markets. Okay. Uh, developed markets can also be volatile, but just generally emerging market is more volatile. So we have different, two different types of markets. Primary market, the share is offered for sale directly from the issuing company. And secondary market, what we normally think of, the stock market. The, the uh, stock market is the secondary market. Okay. <coughs> Primary market, is just the, we'll talk about later in more detail with bonds. The investment bank offers the stock to some investors, okay? Then they're like VIP. Do you understand VIP? Yes. VIP. Then they sell the stock on the secondary market, okay? So the investment bank decides the price between the company and the private investors. Then the private investors start to sell their stock on the stock market, what's called an IPO, Initial Public Offering. <coughs> okay, so we make an order to our broker. Do you understand broker? Can you go to the stock market and walk in? I want some stocks in Google. Give, I have money, here's cash. Give me the stock. Can you do that? No, you're not qualified. You have to, be a, you have to use a broker. Cheapest fee in the US for a broker, nowadays they have online brokers, is about $7 every time you buy or sell, right? But 
If you use the broker, it's going to cost about $30 if you go to their office. But just online, you can do these days online brokers. It's cheap, right? Otherwise, you call your broker by phone and ask them to buy or sell your stock, okay? Do you want to be a broker? No. Mm -hmm. When you get to your degree, it may be useful to get a more specific qualification after your degree. Why? One specific qualification you can get is you could take stockbroker's license. Okay? Then you have the degree and you pass the exam, you have the stockbroker license. Then you can join the bank as a trader or the finance company as a trader. Okay? Uh, we can also make a kind of stop loss. So we tell them the price. If we make this much profit, you have to sell. If we make this much loss, you have to sell. Okay. So <clears throat> we have mainly these days we use electronic exchanges. Okay. Auction markets used to be used. We can still see in the New York Stock Exchange. You see the guys on the floor doing this kind of thing. Have you seen that? Wearing the jackets. Do you know? Have you seen the picture on the news of the New York Stock Exchange? The guys moving their fingers, shouting at each other, doing the auction. That's auction, right? They're organizing buyers, matching the buyers and the sellers, right? But these days we have technology. So most exchanges are, are used nowadays using, the buyer is matched with the seller using computers, not using. They like to keep that in New York because it's good for the tourists or it's kind of a traditional thing, right? But most of the other places have changed to the computer. So if we look at, at these, Bom Bombay is uh, India, Bombay Stock Exchange, the oldest one in Asia is electronic stock exchange, Tokyo, Tokyo Stock Exchange, electronic, Hong Kong, Hong Kong Hang Seng Exchange, London, okay. Uh, New York, we have the New York Stock Exchange, okay, they have traders there. Open auction, different than the other places, okay? NASDAQ is for the computer stocks in the US. So mostly we use the electronic exchange. So there are about 80 major national stock markets, Western and Eastern Europe. Every country has their own stock market in Europe, right? What's the name of the stock index in Germany, the main stock index? We're going to look at it in a minute. Do you know? In France, in London, the name of the index? FTSE in London, right? They all have their own separate stock markets. Over time, we might have a European stock exchange, but one of the problems is we don't have common regulation, okay? Different countries have different regulations, so it's hard to make the same, agree on the regulation and make the same stock exchange. So if you're trading in Europe, you have to trade, you can't go to the European stock exchange, you have to go to German or French, and all of the different ones. So, since the 80s, we have a greater global integration. So, we have diversification, Reduced regulation, improvements in communications technology, increased demand from the companies to sell their stock abroad. So we have more international trading of stocks. Okay? 20 years ago, it wasn't easy for me to buy stocks abroad, but now it's very easy. Just a couple of clicks of the button and I can buy stocks in Brazil, right? So uh, the international equity trading has increased we also have more companies doing cross-listing. So for example, sample, Samsung. Samsung lists on the New York Stock Exchange. What does that mean, to list? What do you think that means? Samsung lists on, as a verb. There are stocks buying and selling in pass over to you. Yes, so we're talking about being on the list of stocks, right? Be on the list of stocks that can be sold. Okay? So Samsung, American investors could buy stocks in Samsung in Korea if they, may, if they invest in Korea. But that's a little bit complicated for American investors. 
So Samsung decided to make it easier. They're going to list on the New York Stock Exchange, and then investors can very easily buy the stock in Samsung. Okay? In order to list on the New York Stock Exchange, Samsung has to change all its accounts to American accounting. Okay? And it has to let its company be reviewed or investigated by the Security Exchange Commission, which re the regulator in the US. Okay? Then they can list their stocks in the US and sell their stocks in the US. So this is increasing. A lot of companies are selling their stocks in other countries. They want to get access to investors. It expands the investor base. Okay? So I'm in Korea, selling my stocks on the Korean stock market. Sure, I'll get some foreign investors who invest in Korea. But if I invest, if I list on their stock exchange, I can get more foreign investors, more investors in my company. Especially if I'm in an emerging market country. Maybe there's not many investors in my country. So I want to find investors from Switzerland, from England, from the UK, who have a lot of money to invest. Okay? So I will list my stock on those stock exchanges. Another, it's like branding. If I list on the stock exchange in New York, do you know Alibaba? Yes, yes. Alibaba also listed one year ago. There was a big media thing for one week, right? On Bloomberg, on CNBC, everything. Alibaba is listing on the New York Stock Exchange. Very big news, right? So then some people who never heard of Alibaba said, Alibaba, what's that? Go on the internet. Oh, great. Start buying things from China, right? On Alibaba. So it's kind of, it established a name recognition for the company too, by selling your stock in another country. So we can get some marketing. Also, it can stop the hostile takeover. Because if I want to take over a company, I need to buy up more stock than anybody else. But if the stock is all over the world, it's harder for me to buy up the stock. If it's just in Korea, only Koreans own the stock, maybe I'll find my friend or my brother or my cousin who owns the stock, and I'll ask them, please sell me your stock so I can get control of the company. Okay? But if the stock belongs to a US investor or UK investor, I have to ask them, please sell me the stock. Maybe they don't sell it to me. Okay? So it's harder to make a hostile takeover. Another advantage. Okay, so uh, then do you have any question about what we studied so far about the stock markets? Okay, then let's uh, finish there for today.